Hello, one, two, three, yep. four, five, six. So apparently the plan is um, the food is on its way and um, this presentation I, I did at CPPCon is an hour long, um, so we might break in the middle if, if when the food gets here if you want, have a, have a little bit of a bite to eat and then uh, pick it up where we left off. Um, or we could just march right through and, and eat and play with algorithms at the same time. Um, so, let's start the first slide here. There we go. Um, how many people here consider themselves not to be experts? Okay, hand oh, all right. I was gonna say, this crowd usually is, is pretty technically savvy, and so for those of you who consider yourself not to be experts, you might find something really cool in, in this presentation tonight. For the rest of you, you will find something hopefully really cool that you know somebody else might need to see. Um, and then you can present to them and say, hey, look at this. Um, anyway, so let's get started. Uh, what are algorithms? Uh, their procedure for solving a problem. Uh, I like this definition because it has numbers and finite steps and computers in it. Um, but basically an algorithm allows you to take a step-by-step -step, uh, procedure for solving something. Um, and that's what a general algorithm is, but what are STL algorithms? Um, the STL algorithms are, are a pre-built library, uh, like much of STL, um, and they're for, for solving general purpose problems. Um, like STL, they come for free with your compiler. Um, that's a good thing. Um, they operate on sequences uh, or sequence containers. Um, they're declarative in syntax, so they help you avoid writing explicit raw loops. Um, they iterate over some or all the members of a sequence. I won't read all of these for you, but this is, this is good stuff here. Um, and of course, like STL, they're designed by experts. Um, they're proven bug-free, as much as can be done, you know, for, for real, um, by millions of lines of code out there, which means that you don't have to debug the algorithm. You just have to debug what you're doing with it. So what is a raw loop, anyway? I think we all know what a raw loop is, but um, let, let's see an example here. So uh, for a while or do loop, um, it's explicitly coded. Um, it often contains many lines of code. Uh, should it? It's a good question. Um, it may cause side effects outside of its scope. This is an important point. Um, there's, no th there's nothing here that prevents you from causing side effects, for one thing. Um, so why would you use an algorithm? Well, an algorithm can be more efficient than a handwritten loop. There, there's many reasons for that. Um, it's cleaner and more clearly abstracted than a raw loop. Um, it, can, it, it, it allows you to see explicitly what the intention is of the codes. For instance, um, a raw loop may just look like a loop with a bunch of code in it, but a set intersection tells you that's what you're trying to do. Um, it contains the side effects inside a clear interface uh, and prevents accidental leakage of side effects. Um, and, and because of the things we just talked about, it eases the, the reasoning about the functionality. Less likely to fail under non-obvious conditions. I see food arriving. It eases reasoning about the surrounding code for all these same reasons. So, what classes of STL algorithms do we have? Um, these are from the C++ standard. Um, the, 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 the sections of the standard are over there in the, in the uh, parentheses. So we have non-modifying sequence operations, mutating sequence operations, um, sorting and related operations, general C algorithms, which we're going to ignore, and uh, general numeric operations. So what are non-modifying sequence operations? These do not modify the input sequence, and they do not emit a result sequence. The algorithm will not cause a side effect in the input sequence, but your function object, if present, may cause a side effect by modifying itself, the sequence, or its environment. Um, Non-modifying sequence operations, here are all of them. Um, 
you can see that there's, there's some that have multiple forms. Um, we're going to talk about some of these. Mutating sequence operations, uh, as you might expect, modify things. They don't modify the input sequence except when the input and output overlap, like in transform, that can happen. Um, they emit an output sequence of results. Uh, the output sequence you know, may overlap. Um, of course, the algorithm will explicitly cause side effects in the output sequence, and the function, function object um, can, can cause side effects in the environment, but it should not modify the input or output sequences. These are your mutating sequence op, uh, operations. And you can see we have copy, move, transform, replace, things that, that modify things, reverse, rotate, shuffle. There's some good stuff in there. And then our sorting related operations. These are going to be cool. We're going to see these in a little bit. Um, mix of non-modifying and mutating operations. Um, and uh, they, they follow a lot of the same rules. Um, for the sorting and related operations, we have a default compare function, which is operator less. Uh, you can supply something different. And um, explicit compare function must not modify the sequence or the iterators if you supply one. OK, this is all legalese. We're going to skip past this pretty quick. Um, you can go read the C++ standard if you want to see all that, because I, I just glossed over a lot of details already, even with what I just said. So, but here's a lot of these things. Sort, nth element, binary search, merge, um, set operations, heap operations, min max, um, some permutation lexico lexicographical stuff. Um, the general numeric operations, there's some really cool ones. We're going to see some of these, too. Some, uh, there's a library of algorithms for doing numeric operations. Um, consist of a bunch of these things. And here are um, our general numeric operations. Accumulate, inner product, partial sum, adjacent difference, and iota. Um, accumulate's cool. We're going to see it. The C library ones um, have been there for a long time. You probably want to know what they are. You might need to use them occasionally, but they don't really apply to what we're talking about tonight. Um, these are the, the two that fall under that in, in, the, uh, in the standard. So let's start with for each and transform. Um, these are your go-to generic algorithm, algorithms for doing uh, things to sequences. They, like every sequence, or like every algorithm, apply an operation to each element in a sequence in order. And they're very similar, except where they're completely different. So let's look at for each. This is probably the most used algorithm. Um, applies an operation to each element, just like all the others. It's a non-modifying sequence operation. It produces uh, no side effect in the algorithm. But your function object could make changes if it wants to. It's considered non-modifying because it produces no output range, but it relies on the function object for mutation if you're going to do anything. Transform, on the other hand, is a mutating operation. It does a lot of the same things. Um, if the input and output ranges overlap, it can do things in place. Uh, the algorithm produces the side effect. The function object shouldn't do that. Um, and it's, it's considered a mutating uh, algorithm because it explicitly produces an output range by modifying, by applying the function to modify the result range. Um, let's see, did I put the return? Yeah. So this re it returns uh, an iterator pointing one, pa one past the last element in the result range. So you can, you can use it to input into other things as well. All right, so let's see an example, because we want to get past the boring stuff. Um, so for each, let's, let's generate a single hash for all strings in a vector. So we have a vector of strings, and we want to make one value that's a hash of all those strings. So we're going to apply this, this for each. So um, homework up front, we're going to create a, a, a little functor thing here to generate a hash from a string. So we pass in, pass in a string in our, in our operator. Um, let's see if my, if my pointer can, ooh, look at that. All right, cool. Um, so we have our, our operator parens here, and we pass in a string. And we're going to call accumulate. Oh, wait a minute. That's another algorithm. All right, let's take a look at that. So accumulate is a non-modifying numerics operation. That was the part of that numeric set that we saw. 
uh, it produces no side effect itself. Um, it can modify some stuff up there. And like I said, I, I won't read all of these, but Accumulate differs from 4-each. It's actually very similar to 4-each, but it differs from 4-each in, in that this algorithm carries a value from, fun from um, item to item while it's, it's visiting each of them, whereas for each carries a, a, a function object from item to item. Um, and Accumulate has an op a default operator plus, but we're gonna uh, supply something different. Um, all right, so we've got this, this hash string thing, and we're gonna get a hash of a string by calling Accumulate on it with a hash char function. And then we're going to uh, call a hash all strings. Or we're going to create this hash all strings thing here that uses for each uh, with each string in the vector and hash string. What's going to happen is this hash string is going to uh, get carried uh, from item to item. And at the end, it's going to get returned to us. And it's keeping state as it goes. At the end, we're just going to return that, that final state value. And so our final function here uh, to make all this work, uh, we're going to test it out, make a vector of some, some, some string values. We're going to ca uh, call hash all strings on it. And then we're going to put that value out. Um, some extra little bit of background homework here. Um, a rotate left and a hash char function. This is what we used in accumulate to hash each individual character. Um, all right, so that's kind of cool, but how often do you really need that? What you probably want is to hash each of the strings in the vector individually and generate a hash for each of them. So what we're going to do is take a vector of strings and create a vector of hashes. So this is very similar, but not exactly the same. We're going to use accumulate again to do our individual string hashing. Um, we're going to create a, a very similar uh, function here where we're going to hash each string. Um, and so we be, we're being passed in a value. Um, we're going to, uh, oh, this is our vector, sorry. Like I said, I haven't, I haven't given this talk for a few months. And I just, they threw it at me at the last minute and said, hey, do this talk. So, all right, I'm reading my code again for the first time in a while. All right, okay, so hold that thought. They said the food is ready for us to eat. Let's pause here for a second and we'll come back. All right, so coming back to our, our, our example with the transform, where we're going to generate a vector of hashes from a vector of strings, we're using the same accumulate um, wrapped in a hash string method, which we were just talking about. Um, and this time, we're going to write this, this nice little convenient function, convenience function to wrap our, uh, what we're doing here so that we take our vector as an argument um, we create a result vector and uh, we simply use transform to iterate over our vector um, and stick the results into our result vector using our hash string method here to do the work. And um, it would look something like this. So here's once again our vector of some strings. Um, we're going to get a result vector back from calling our hash string method. And uh, then we can, we can input, output our results. Um, pretty simple stuff. So we haven't written any explicit loops here. Uh, even used for each here, you might notice. Um, well, I took the result begin, result end, create a little lambda just to do a C out. Um, but no loops. Our accumulate does our hashing. Our transform iterates over our vector. Um, takes the strings that are coming in, generates a vector of hashes going out. All right, so how about some other algorithms that are cool? Any of, all of, none of, um, these can be pretty handy. Um, so just like uh, many of our other algorithms, they apply a function object 
to a sequence or each item in a sequence and they determine whether any, all, or none of the elements in the sequence are true. Because these can figure out the answer before going through every item sometimes, um, they can uh, exit early. They don't have to iterate over everything if they know the answer has already been determined, of course. If you're saying um, all of and not all of the things match your uh, requirement, then you can stop. You don't have to keep going. Um, all of example. Uh, let's validate some HTTP headers. So I, I generated a regular expression here that is, is roughly uh, useful for a basic HTTP header syntax uh, format. And then uh, we're going to have a, a headers valid function that tells us whether a vector containing um, a whole bunch of headers is all valid or not. And so I'm just going to say return all of headers begin, headers end. I'm going to create a little lambda that passes in um, each of the headers in turn because all of is going to call this function for each item in the sequence. It's going to check against the regex and find out if it matches or not. If any of these headers don't match this regular expression, um, all of will determine that this is false and return false. If it iterates through all of them and they are true, of course, then we'll know that they're all valid because it will return true. No explicit loop here. I'm just using all of to call this function. Um, what this might look like. All right, so here's some headers. And uh, I'm going to say uh, headers valid was the function we created, if you remember right. And so this is our convenience function the reps are all of, headers valid. Um, so I'm going to pass these headers into headers valid and uh, see, okay, so these come out true, false, false, false. Uh, this one's false because there's a space here. This one's false for some other reason. And so you can go through those later if you want. But anyway, it works. Um, any of. All right, so let's do something a little bit cooler. Let's do um, a search where, what is it we're doing here? I have to remember, like I said, I wrote these, I should have written that in the description. Um, so uh, we're going to, oh, okay, we're going to find uh, a header value that we're looking for. So uh, we can pass into this convenience function um, some a bunch of headers, uh, the header we want to find and the value we want to find. And it will find, uh, determine whether any of those headers match what we're looking for. And it's going to do, uh, we can, of course, this isn't great code because you could do regular expression in, uh, injection here. We're just taking strings and injecting them into a regular expression. That's not really best practice, but it, 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 it works for the slide. Um, once again, some examples. So we've, we've got some things that, uh, we've got some headers here, and so we're telling it, uh, take our headers and look for a header named this with a value of that. So we have a, a true, false, and a true. Um, once again, if you want to go through and, and look at those and see why they match and don't match, you're welcome to. But it works. And this is an, a, an example of using any of. So it's checking to see if any of those headers match the things that we're asking for. Um, but I want to get even more complex. And because of that, I'm just going to use the general for each. And in this case, what I'm going to do is simultaneously validate and search. So we're going to find out. Um, we're going to do this in a rich way. We're going to find out if all of the headers are valid. And if there are invalid headers, um, how many of them are there? And, uh, and we're going to search for some, some specific headers all at the same time. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is create this, this struct to hold that information while it's, it's in process. And since we're, since we're being all object oriented and stuff, we might as well just go ahead and throw a functor in there um, to do the actual work of determining um, whether this matches our criteria or not. So this, this struct is going to contain our counters, uh, a map of the headers that were found if they matched, um, 
the, the strings we're searching for and um, whether our headers are good or not, um, which says that we don't have any bad headers and our good headers are greater than zero. Um, and then of course, then our reg regular expression matches first for the header uh, format and then searching for the strings we're looking for. And we'll do some stuff like incrementing good headers count or incrementing bad headers count and sticking things into our found headers. All right, so how do we use all that? Well, here's our headers data struct abbreviated once again so we can see it. Um, and then we're gonna write a little function called headers parse, header parse, that takes headers, uh, our find string for the header itself and for the value. We're going to declare a header data struct. We're going to get our two find strings and stick them in there so we know what to look for. And for each, we'll take the thing that the, the, the function object, which in this case is actually a struct, and pass it from item to item as it goes and iterates over the sequence. And at the end, it will return it to us. And once again, we're saving some state in there so we can get it back. Um, so in this case, I'm going to say for each, headers begin, headers end, HD. And since it's also got this function operator on there, um, it will be called to do all the work. And that's all there is to it. And then turn our struct fully filled out with all the information from our, he our headers just by calling for each with this information. The output's going to look something like this. And it's really hard to read because I made it really small. Um, But uh, here's some headers. Um, here's something to look for. Headers parse. And um, I have a Boolean value. And, uh, headers good. And then I have my counts. Headers. So HD is going to be, did I have operator for streams on there? I don't remember. We'll take a look. Um, and then I, I have some output here. So uh, did I? Yeah, so here's the output. So my, my headers part true. Um, they're valid. Valid, not valid. Um, there was four good headers, zero bad headers. Four good headers, zero bad headers. Here's we had a bad header, one. Um, and we had one header that matched the search string. It's output here. None that matched the search string. Matched the search string even though we had a bad header. So this is the output of this unit test code here of this code that we've written. And it works once again. All right, so let's look at something completely different because um, we, we don't want to get too bored here. Let's do something that's, that's not like that. Adjacent find. Um, it searches for items in a sequence that are adjacent. Um, it applies an operator to them, which you can define, and it returns an iterator to the first pair of elements that meet that condition. Uh, the default condition is equality, obviously, but we could do other things as well if we want to. Um, so we could write, even though there already is and is sorted in the algorithms library, we could write one real easily using a JSON find. Um, and how would you do that? Well, you could say, Give me back an iterator by calling adjacent find on begin and end with the greater uh, operation. And that's going to say, basically, greater works because it's asking if the first value is greater than the second value. If so, then the test fails. It's not sorted. Um, if the first value is less than or equal to the second value, and it's going to apply this all the way through the sequence, then of course, um, it is sorted. So if we get to the end and we don't get an iterator, the vector is sorted, else it's not. Um, so for, for this thing here, this is obviously sorted, even though there's a couple, there's a couple duplicates right here. Um, so applying that first, um, the output will be as sorted. Now, um, it, it looks like I omitted the code here, but if we then, oops, if we then uh, inserted a, a another value in here in the wrong spot, we would get back a not sorted. Um, adjacent find 
example here, let's see. Test for sequence deviation, oh yeah, okay. So, let's say you had a sequence of numbers and they were changing. Um, and you wanted to find out if that sequence of numbers was changing by a little bit, which is within your tolerance, or if they're changing by a lot and it's outside your tolerance. You might be able to use a JSON find to do that. Um, so we could write this check deviation function. And what it's going to take is a container and allowed deviation. The allowed deviation is basically just how much we're going to allow it to change. I'm going to call adjacent find. I'm going to write a little lambda here. Um, I'm going to, it, it, the lambda takes the first value and the second value and, and then returns whether it meets the condition or not. Um, I'm going to say my, my allowed deviation is just a, a multiple. So I'm going to check, I'm going to say my limit is, is the v1 times the multiple and return whether it's within or without a limit. And so uh, an example might be, so we have this sequence of numbers, 1, 1.05, 1.06, 1.04, 1.09, 1.15, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 
is like sort, except if it finds equivalent items, it will keep their orders in, intact. Um, also sorts in place. Partial sort um, allows you to take and sort a subsequence drawing from a subset that is equal or larger than the sequence that you're sorting. So you can consider a large number of items and just sort the top n, for instance. Um, there's no stable, stable version of that. And then partial sort copy is like partial sort, but you can put your output into a different range. Um, sort and stable sort. So let's assume you have an object with strings containing first name, middle name, last name. Um, you might have other stuff in there too, but those are the important things. And we want these things sorted by uh, you know, a meaningful way, which is uh, with last name, then first name, then middle name precedence. Um, how are we going to do that? Should be pretty easy, I would think. Um, so let's, let's define some, some person data first. All right, so here's a vector of persons. First, middle, last. Um, we're going to do some sorting on these. So we're going to start with the least influential data first. Um, so we're going to call sort on our vector. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to sort on the middle, the middle name, which is right down the middle there, obviously. So this is going to do a sort on the middle name, or the middle letter here. Um, next thing we're going to do is the first name, which is the next most influential data. You'll notice now we, we switch from sort to stable sort. We didn't really care whether it was stable or not for the first sort because uh, we're just going to end up rearranging stuff again anyway. But now that we've already sorted some of the data, we want to keep the things that have already been found to be equivalent in the middle name field in the same relative position. So we switch to stable sort and we sort in the first name. Do it again stable sort on the last name, and uh, that's our most influ in influential data last. And looks something like this. So here was our initial input data. Um, it rearranged them so they look like this. You'll notice that we have a couple of them that are the same. Um, these could have come out in, in either order because we used a regular sort, not a stable sort. but then when we went and sorted on the first name, we chose a stable sort. So even though it rearranged things once again, um, the things that were equal have been kept in the same relative order, supposedly. Um, and then we've, we've done the, the uh, stable sort once again here on the last name. And so Jane came across and Joe came across, same relative order. Um, Joe A. Smith, Joe P. Smith, Sarah B. Smith. So the, so the ordering was re retained because of the stable sort. Partial sort. So that will take an input sequence of sort candidates, which may be larger than the number of elements that you actually want sorted, and the order of items from the input sequence that are unsorted in the output sequence is implementation defined. So if you have a small set that's sorted and a larger set that's your source set, these may be in any order. Um, it's an in-place operation. Uh, partial sort copy will allow you to put it into a, a separate container. It's obviously more f efficient than a full sort because you're only sorting some of the data. Um, so for instance, we got some numbers here. And we're going to do a partial sort on them. Um, from the beginning to the beginning plus 5 uh, is what we want sorted. And as our input range, we're taking all the way to be, uh, beginning plus 8, which means these two items are going to be omitted from the sort altogether. That's our input range. The, the, this high tech drawing right there, that's, that's your uh, actual sorted range. Um, and so it's going to look something like this. Here's our, here's our input range. Here's our sorted output. 
um, you'll notice everything from the yellowish color uh, makes it to the other side. But because we're only sorting the top five, uh, and by the way, this is a reverse sort. You might know that I chose a, a, a sequence that, that makes it reversed. So we're going from, from biggest to smallest. You'll notice that all the things that are biggest get sorted. Um, 17, 22, and 12 fall below 34, but they were from the input range. And you'll notice they're also in undetermined order. But they made it over there. And these two things were omitted, so they're just copied over and modified. So there's your partial sort. Um, and what about your sort of sorts? Well, partition, stable partition, partition copy. These are fun too. So partition reorders the sequence. So all items before a partition point are less and all items after a partition point are not less, which means greater than or equal. Um, order of items in the lower and upper up subsets is implementation defined, but they will be properly partitioned. Um, the order of equivalent items is implementation defined. If things order equivalently, they might get moved around. Stable partition, of course, allows them to not get moved around. And partition copy allows you to put them in a different container. Um, and then there's this thing called nth element. Uh, who, who knows what nth element is? Somebody's got to know. Oh, there's one. Okay. Um, Nth element is also a partition operation, but it's, it's special. Um, so it reorders the sequence uh, such that all items before the nth element are less. So you're picking your partition point as a position in, in the container. And all items after nth are not less. And the order of the items is just the same as partition. Um, Except the item at nth is exactly the item that would be there if it was fully sorted. Um, this operates in place. Uh, it doesn't have lots of other permutations. So um, partition compared to nth element. Very similar. Partition's a sequence based on a condition. Partition's a sequence based on a position. So this is given a condition. This is given a position. Um, partition points not guaranteed to be the value at that position. Uh, nth element is the element that would exist in that position in a fully sorted sequence. Um, otherwise, you know, I won't read all this for you, but you can see they're similar in a lot of ways, but they have some details that are different. Um, so let's see a partition example. So we've got our numbers coming in again. Um, our partition iterator is going to get returned by our partition operation, and that's going to tell us where the partition point is. We determine our partitioning based on this function, which says everything less than 50 is going to go at the front. Everything over 50, 50 or greater is going to go uh, after the partition point. And so it's going to pick out these things here. And it's going to do something like this. So here's, here's our, our input sequence. And it's taken and gathered all these blue items because they're less than 50 and uh, stuck them at the front of the container. And then everything else falls at the back of the container. And here's our partition point. Now, like I said earlier, ordering's not guaranteed. This is a partition, not a sort. But everything's where it belongs as far as uh, where it belongs in the container. Uh, partition copy is, is almost exactly the same thing, except that it will take our input sequence and we can generate two output sequences. So we can take this mishmash of things and say, here's our container that's small stuff, and here's our container that's big stuff. Or we could you know, partition on some other thing, too. Maybe these are classes with some, some determining factor. But anyway, it looks almost the same as before, except now we have two output sequences that are, are completely separate from the input sequence. Kind of a, a cool way to do that. Um, so how about mixing up partitions? So we can take our person example that we just had a few minutes ago and make that into an employee struct. And we can partition, partition management and individuals into separate containers because maybe they do you know, totally separate things in the accounting system. Um, or partition the management and the, and the executives and we'll partition the architects before the individuals and still we'll partition the senior and junior employees. It's all going to be fun. Um, 
So let's say our employee struct is to derive from that person class we had earlier. Um, so we've got our names, but now in addition we have a position. So employee type manager, junior architect, executive, senior, junior manager. Now we're gonna we're gonna do some stuff with these guys. Now we're not gonna sort them necessarily. We're just gonna partition them. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is separate our employees into management and individuals. So we're gonna partition copy into a management sequence and an individual sequence based on whether the employee is a manager or not, which is to, uh, because it, we, we're using a, an enum here. If it's less than manager, uh, less than or equal to manager, then it's in management. Um, so is it, is it somebody who's in management? Um, so we ended up with a management individuals, individual sequences. Now, the executives get the company jet and the managers get the company car. So we're going to need to do some partitioning as well. So let's take this uh, management sequence and partition it based on whether the employee type is an executive. Uh, and then what's returned is our iterator. Everybody before the jet iterator is allowed to use the company jet. Um, if you're if you're if you're after that, then you are the company in the company car class. Um, now let's say the is in the, in the individuals. The architects get the company Segway. Everyone else gets the company bike. <laughs> All right. So, so here we're going to do a, a similar partition operation. Get my pointer back. Um, we're going to go over the individuals container this time. We're going to say is the type architect or not. And that's going to simply put all the architects up to the front of the container, return an iterator saying where that ends. So that's our Segway iterator. Everybody up to the Segway iterator gets to use the company Segway. Um, and then, you know, the non architects, uh, we're going to have to partition those, uh, you know, from higher to lower seniority because um, the people who, who aren't as senior, they get to use the old bike, whereas the senior people get to use the new bike. All right, so we're going to do a stable partition here because we've already partitioned the individuals once. Uh, we partitioned them to get our architects up front. Now we're going to stable partition um, to, keep, to find our senior and our junior employees while keeping the architects at the front of the, part, uh, of the container and um, return an iterator that tells us where the old bikes start. And it looks something like this. Okay, so here's our, our example output. So the management's partitioned and we have an executive who gets the jet and a couple of managers that get the car. Uh, the architects are partitioned. A junior, junior and senior are not yet partitioned because we did that afterwards. So we can see we have architect, junior, senior, junior. Um, architect gets a segue. We had an iterator for that. The rest get the bike. Now when we do that final partition, we can see that the architect and then the seniors after him and the juniors get partitioned at the bottom. Notice we're not doing any sorting here. None of this is sorted. Um, so these names may not be in the right order if you want a sorted output. But the, the partitioning is much quicker than a sort. Um, and it gives the information that we need. And so now we know who gets the segue, who gets the new bike, and who gets the old bike based on the iterators that were returned. Uh, from our operations there. Nth element. All right, so the common example that everybody gives is finding the median value in a sequence or finding the percentile value in a sequence. So we'll throw them up on a slide so you can see them. Um, here's a bunch of numbers and we want to find the median value or the middle value of the sequence. And so we can say uh, the sequence divided by 2 is our nth element. Give me the nth element, v begin, v end plus nth to v end. And you will see that this is the, the iterator that you turn to me um, is, is right here. And that is our median value. Now, notice that it's partitioned as well. Everything before the median value is what would be there 
in a properly partitioned set, and everything after the median value is in a properly partitioned set. It's not sorted, but it's partitioned. Um, find the percentile value. Say we want to find the 75th percentile. We can do the same thing. Take the size times percentile divided by 100. Do, do the exact same operation. Turns out that it's 72 um, at this position here. And um, as we can see, it's, it's still properly partitioned. These are all greater than 72. These are all less than 72. So a partial, partial sort versus nth element plus sort. Let's say you wanted to do a partial sort. So say you had a million web pages, and you wanted to find the top 20 web pages sorted by number of hits. And so we have a large sequence, but we only care about the top 20. Um, and we want them in order, but everything after that we don't care what its order is. Um, we could do that with partial sort. You could also do that with nth element because it partitions. So that would give our top 20 things partitioned at the top, and then you could just sort the top 20 things. Which is better? Well, this is really cool. It's a great question because this kind of uh, goes to the thing it goes to the, the 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 principle about writing more code versus writing less code the principle of using a a pre-built algorithm or a steel container rather than manipulating it yourself sometimes that can be more efficient because the people who implemented all of these pieces of the stl know the internals and sometimes they can even access the internals in ways that you wouldn't be able to from outside. So let's find out. So what this would look like, of course, a partial sort. Here's your vector of things, uh, vector plus 20, because we want the top 20 to vector to end. And we're going to use the greater operator to find what we're looking for. Um, or you could do nth element followed by a sort of just the top 20 things. Now, um, are they equivalent? That, that's a good question to ask first. Does this really give you the same results? Um, well, let's, let's write an example and find out. So uh, say we have a v1 and a v2. Uh, these two vectors are identical because I just made a copy. And I'm going to do a partial sort. So I'm, this init vec just fills it with a bunch of random stuff. So the v1 and v2 are identical. So partial sort v1, v1 begin plus 20, vn greater. Uh, do the same thing with the nth element and sort operations. Um, and the first thing we're going to do is use the equal operation to determine whether the top 20 things are equal. And then we're going to use it on everything after the top 20 to find out if those are equal. And what we find out is that, in fact, the sorted portions of the vectors are equal true. So they are equivalent for the sorted portion. Um, the unsorted portion, there's no promises made that those are in any particular order. And it turns out that they are not in the same order. That's OK. We don't care about them. So for the purposes of what we want to do, um, they are uh, equal enough. Um, I have a note down here. I thought it was on a slide, but it's not. So for this ex specific example, now this is on x86, 64, um, with GCC 4.9, I think it was, and Clang 3.8, something like that. Um, nth element plus sort is roughly 40% slower. Uh, with GCC and roughly 50, 55% slower with Clang. Um, so as you might expect, the, uh, the single, way, you know, single function call is, is faster than splitting it up into two pieces. It wasn't always true. There were some aberrant implementations out there sometimes where that was reversed, but I think that was more of an implementation problem than, than an, an, an algorithmic problem. All right, so. In the interest of, of moving this along, let's see how we're doing here. Um, 
rotate, another cool algorithm. Moves elements specified in a source range to destination position while moving displaced items to the source position. It rotates them. Um, it's a simple way to move one or more elements from one position in a container to another one without using erase and insert. T technically, this is a left to rotate, but who cares? Um, it moves elements in place. Rotate copy does the same thing, except it copies elements to a separate sequence. Um, and then some legalese. So, a naive implementation to move one item in a sequence might look something like this. Say we have this vector here, and it's got all these numbers in it, and we want to do something like this. So is that what I'm doing? Yes. Okay. So I want to take this, and I want to move it over there, and of course that's going to make these slide that way one. And so I might do this, uh, and that's at position two, so I might get an iterator to that, that thing there. Um, I can get its value, I can erase it, and then I can insert it back in where it belongs over there, and it, the output looks correct. Um, that, that, this doesn't look very, very good though, I don't like that. Um, so let's do it a better way. So let's do the same exact thing, except we're going to get our iterator to the thing we want to move and where it's going to go, and we're just going to call rotate. And it's going to take those two things and swap them. Now, I haven't removed or inserted anything, so I don't have to worry about invalidating anything. Um, it's all done for me, and it's probably faster. In fact, I'd be surprised if it wasn't. But you can do it with a range of items, too. So let's say we want to take these three things, move them here, while these two things slide this way. It's the same exact thing. So we get our position for the start of this, and start of that, and uh, we tell it to rotate, and the output is two, three, four, five, six, and we see it turns into five, six, two, three, four. Um, so GCC's definition, rotates the elements of the range first, last, by middle minus first positions, so that the element at middle is moved to first, the element at middle plus one is moved to first plus one, and so on for each element in the range. This effectively swaps the ranges first to middle and middle last. That was actually the best definition I could find, and it was in their source code. Um, there's lots of other ones that are much harder to read than that. Slide. This is a Sean Parent goodie. Um, if anybody's seen C++ seasoning, and I'm sure lots of people have because it's very popular and very good, he's presented it at uh, at going native and I think a couple of other places. Um, you may have already seen this, but here it is because it's good stuff. So what if you wanted to implement an algorithm that would move a range to a point in either direction without worrying about iterator ordering? So, for example, you wanted to move, say, uh, a multi-selected thing in a GUI from one position to another position in a list. When using rotate, it's important to get the order of iterators correct. So we want to write something that's more robust than just rotate. Um, and then we want a bonus, we want to return a pair indicating the destination once we've done this operation. How could we do that? So we're going to take that and we're going to move it over there. Or we might take this guy Uh, all right. My slides look a little funky. Okay. I don't know why that blank is blank, but it wasn't. <laughs> um, so anyway, code might look something like this. Um, slide. If p is less than f, I believe there's supposed to be a picture here that shows us that. I don't, don't know why it's missing. If p is less than f, p is um, this guy, first, middle, last. Um, p is less than f, we return rotate from, uh, return p to rotate pfl. 
and this rotate will return where the rotated uh, destination was placed. So this is going to give us the range um, from P to uh, the insertion, and if L is less than P, return rotate FLP to P. Otherwise, if neither of these is true, return F to L, first to last, P. So that's where we want to put it, first to last. Um, I'm sorry, I apologize, this slide doesn't look right because it, it was really cool. Um, but this is our rotate. So what this is going to do is, or sorry, our slide, it's going to use the rotate function dependent on the ordering of items and return us where things are. Um, now there's a gather as well, which is even, even cooler because this is going to take multi-selected items that are disjoint and move them. This slide doesn't look right either. Anyway, what this would look like is all of these yellow things are going to slide together right around that P. And um, so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to take a multi-selection and put it into a position in the list. And that position is P. Um, how would we do that? Well, gathers what we're going to write. How are we going to write it? Um, well, let's think about breaking this, this problem into two pieces. Um, break the problem space into the part before the destination, destination position and the part after the destination position. Now, our job is to take these and move them here take these and move them here. Any idea what would do that? Looks a lot like a partition. So we're going to take this, make it look like that. And so your gather function is simply going to look like this. Uh, return stable partition f to p that's not one of the things we want. So it's going to put all of the not ones. It's going to put all of the white things first. And then also, stable partition from P to L of all the things that are S. So it's going to take, take all the white things, put them first in this partition. And it's going to take all the green things and put them first in this partition, stick it back together. And here's all, all of our stuff gathered in the middle. Um, all right, coming, coming close to the end here. Set difference. Say we want to process some configuration updates. Uh, you store some configuration information in an ordered container. You receive updated configuration on a regular basis, and you want to quickly determine what has changed. Uh, let's do something like this. So we have a vector of new items, a vector of removed, removed items that we're going to have to determine based on our current configuration. So we call set difference. We have our current config, begin end, our new data, up end, and uh, our back inserter. So we're going to insert all of the things that have been removed from the configuration. In other words, they're in the current config, but they're no longer in the update. And so the set difference is going to insert those things in our removed items. We're also going to call it set difference from update to current to tell us which things are in the, the update, the new data, that are not in the current data. And these are going to be things that are new. Um, so our set difference allows us to then see um, what's changed. Um, for instance, say our current config says 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we get an update that says 1, 3, 4, Six, seven. Um, two is no longer there. Three, four, five is no longer there. And we have a new six and seven. So we're going to do our set difference here with our removed items, what's in current that's not an update, and our set difference with the new items, what's in update that's not in current. And it turns out that removed is five and two. It's not ordered. Um, and added is seven and six. Um, 
coming soon to a compiler near you, parallel algorithms. These are an S uh, STD experimental parallel. Um, they're currently experimental. They're proposed for a future release. But um, things like parallel sort, parallel partition, parallel, you know, whatever, things that could, could leverage multiple threads to make uh, an expensive operation cheaper. Um, play with them. Uh, they look pretty cool. Um, uh, so, and so a quick review. The, the key takeaway with a lot of these examples is um, be familiar with all the varied algorithms because they're, they're a lot of them that do cool things and they're all different. And the good way to do that is to write some code that exercises each of them and explores what their quirks and characteristics are. Um, uh, write your own ad adapters for the for the existing algorithms that maybe take a container instead of a begin and end or do, uh, do something else that wrap it into a nice interface or give it a nice name or implement your own algorithms like slide and gather um, and then so once again a list of of all of the the algorithms that we have you can see that there's there's a lot of them to play with and finally, a shout out to my sponsor, F5 Networks, who encourages me to do all of this fun stuff when they're not making me fix bugs. Um, if you're looking for something cool and challenging to do and you're bored with your current job, come talk to us. We have lots of cool stuff. Um, and then my shameless advertising. Um, I am very slowly working on a book on this. and. Someday we'll be done with it. <laughs> um, if you have any really creative uses for these algorithms, like I had up there or even better than mine, um, send them my way. I might just use them. And uh, the slides and the sample code are posted up on my website. So you can go there and, and get them if you want to have them for your very, very own. And so that's all. Any questions? One thing I didn't I know you didn't mention on this review, but that is important to some of us are the big old complexity measures mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, will that be in the book? Maybe. Um, there's I, I want to make this accessible, um, and, and, and there's a great deal of very specific legalese language in the standard that describes precisely how each algorithm works. And so there's kind of a balance between how much of that you want to include and how much you want to leave out just to make it easy to see you know, what is the spirit of the algorithm. Um, but, but you're right. I mean, it's good to know, and it's important. Um, Sometimes, <laughs> I mean, because because in certain cases it's like, well, it's what you, it's the tool you have, and it's better than the, than the, the other tool you might have used, which is to write it yourself. Um, but if it comes to the case where it's like, do I use this algorithm or this specialized uh, mathematical library, you know, then yeah, that might definitely be a, a evaluation. This this library may be a little bit harder to use, but maybe it's significantly faster. Um, Mm -hmm. In one step or in two steps, you can look at the sure. promises about the complexity measures for each of those. Yeah, and, and in some cases, the promises for the complexity are general or generic enough that it might not answer that question. Um, so so in the, in like in that case, I just resorted to writing two different tests and timing it over and over again until I came out with numbers that I thought were stable enough to say, yeah, 50%. Um, and of course, that will change by compiler impl implementation too. I mean, it, like, you know, GCC and Clang were different. Um, so the, the implementation might make a difference. Yeah. There really are loops there. They're just hidden underneath the surface. 
You totally need to see Eric Niebler's talk. <laughs> is there any lazy evaluation? In no. There's not in this, but um, that once again is, is something that he's uh, very aggressively um, pursued with the um, ranges and the STL2 stuff he's doing. So it, it is a, a, on the future vision map, for sure. Good question. All right. Thank you for coming. <laughs>